can see the beautiful detail and, of course, the wonderful color palette. <laughs> Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to be read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Kareen from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning. This podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Keep It Fictional podcast from the Port Moody Public Library. My name is Sadie, and I am very excited to be here today with all of my book friends to talk about books our favorite topic, our favorite subject, our favorite hobby, our favorite way to spend all of our time. So the topic that we are going to be talking about today is something that I am extremely interested in. Now, many people out there are familiar with the story of Cinderella, maybe the story of Beauty and the Beast, maybe the story of Zeus and Poseidon they've heard of, the Greek gods, the Roman gods even. But are people out there as familiar with the Orisha of the Yoruba traditions or the Kami of Japanese mythology? Do you know who Oya is, the Orisha of winds, lightning, and violent storms? Do you know who Brahma, the creator, or Shiva, the destroyer is, or Osiris, Isis, and Horus? of Egyptian mythology. You might be familiar with some of these names, some of these people in mythology and folklore, but they might not be quite as familiar to you as some of the Western gods and goddesses and Western mythology and folklore. So today I'm very excited to talk all about books that are inspired by and influenced by non-Western mythology. So this could range from a variety of different places all over the world. And I think that with the books we are going to talk about, it is going to bring us to all different parts of the world today, which is very, very exciting. So I'm curious for my book friends, I'm going to introduce all my book friends today. We have Virginia with us, Kareen, Liz, and Fiona. And I'm very excited to see which books and which mythologies you have all brought for us today. So I'm curious, before we get into our discussion today, was this an easy topic for people? Was this something that you already read a lot of and so you had something ready to go? Or did you find that you had to look for something and read something specifically for this episode today? It was, an, it was another straight up nightmare. Straight up nightmare. Um, and that's not, I actually like reading um, creation stories and folklore and different tales from different places, but I like reading them in their original format. I don't always love a retelling. And so I really struggled to force myself to find a retelling and not just go back and do a, a collection of, uh, of myths. So I, I, it was a difficult brief, but I feel like I nailed it. I'm very excited. We will see what book Kareen picked that that really touched on this topic. And she picked a really good one. I think she's doing a little dance. Okay, we're excited. Excellent. <laughs> uh, Virginia, was it as difficult for you as it was for Kareen? Um, I feel like the difficult part was more because I feel like I don't have enough background for the original works. So when I'm picking the different ones, I'm like, it's hard, harder for me to gauge like how close is this to a the original work um you know what parts of it and I will I want to learn more I want to know more about it which I guess is a great thing because now that I read it I can go and read the original and find out what the original is like but I just I just feel like maybe I'm missing something you know like when I'm reading like sort of retelling and so I just wish that I know more for that so excellent and Fiona what about you is this an easy topic for you uh it was so so um I think a little bit like Kareen, I like to read the actual tales, but I'm not so much about things that are retellings, but I actually found a really great happy medium. I really love stories like, you know, whether they be modern or not, uh, that intertwine fairy tales to sort of give them new meaning. And so I learned something about myself this time of, uh, yeah, that's something I really, really enjoy. Excellent. It's always nice to, to learn something about ourselves with the reading that we do as well. 
<laughs> and what about you, Liz? Was this an easy topic for you? I had to do a bit of looking. Um, I realized that I don't really read a lot of retellings. And I think the one or two that maybe I have I've already talked about on our podcast. Um, so the book I'll talk about later. I think Virginia said it's a bit of a stretch. However, I'm going to ask everybody to hear me out because I think it's a really good book. That's fair. So we're going to have to maybe suspend our disbelief a little bit when it comes to the mythology and the folklore aspect, just a tiny bit, which is okay. That's okay. (laughs) Well, I am so excited to see and hear about all of the books that you have all brought today. So why don't we get right into it? We're going to start today with Virginia. So Virginia, what was your non-Western folktale or mythology? I picked for you a first book in a trilogy. It is called A Spark of White Fire, and it's by Sangu Mandana, and it's book one of the Celestial Trilogy. And I have to say, I haven't felt the need to binge read a series for quite a while. But after I finished the first book, I'm like, oh no, I need to read the next one. I need to know what happens. It is an addictive series. And the nice thing about it is book three just came out this year. So it is a complete trilogy. So you can also binge read it just like I did. And the Celestial Trilogy is inspired and based on the Indian epic poem, the Maharabada. And for reference sake, this is 10 times longer than the Iliad. It has 100,000 verses. And so I haven't got around to reading that yet, but hopefully one day I will be able to. And in Sangu Mandana's version, the story gets turned into a space opera, which is equally epic. And I don't think there's a more suitable word to describe this trilogy than the word epic, because there is just so much drama in this. Our story begins with a competition. King Dashan, one of the kings of the 40 plus kingdoms that is in this galaxy, decided to host a competition. And the grand prize for this competition is the indestructible, invincible AI power spaceship called the Titania. If you have this indestructible warship on your military, then it is going to be a huge boost to your power. And you can pretty much go around and, I don't know, like take over anybody you like. So you can tell this is a really great prize for all the different kingdoms. So competing in this competition is all the princes and all the princesses, all the heirs to the thrones all around the galaxy. But there are two people in particular that everybody got their eyes on, Alexei and Max. Alexei is a prince in exile. He and his brother and his mother have been kicked out of the kingdom. After his father died, who was originally the king, his uncle usurped the throne. They send them away to this other random planet. And now Alexei is hoping that if he can win Titania, then he would be able to reclaim his throne that he believes belongs to him. On the other side, we have Max. Max is the adopted son of King Alpha, who is the uncle of Alexei. So he is known as the thief prince because his uncle, or I guess his his father, I should say, stole the throne. And so everybody's watching these two because they also happen to be the ones who have the best chance of winning this competition. And so they are kind of see like, how is the balance of power going to shift if one of them won the grand prize? For some reason, some people have noticed that, you know what, King Dashan might have this designed this competition kind of in favor of Alexei. You'll find out why later. But it seems like he has picked something that he knows Alexei is really good at because His competition is something that Alexei's trainer, his mentor, always makes him do. It is one of his favorite practice. So perhaps he is kind of favoring Alexei for some reason. So what they have to do is that each contestant is going to get one shot. They get a bow and an arrow and they have to hit a target. But it's not very easy because this target is this mechanical fish that is kind of flying around in the air and you have to try to hit it. And King Dashan said, not only just have to hit it, you have to pierce it through the eye of this mechanical fish. But that is not all. 
you cannot stare at the target. You cannot track it with your eyes. Well, you can, but you have to not look at the target, but you have to look at its reflection in a bowl of water. So you can't even like really directly look at it. So it makes it all the more harder. And so everybody takes his turn. Pretty much nobody managed to hit the target, not even Max. And Alexi, you know, to no surprise of everybody, because again, this is something that he practiced a lot, managed to hit it. Didn't quite pierce the eye, but he was the closest to all of them. So King Dashan declared that Alexi is the winner. Everybody cheer because there are a lot of people who are kind of cheering for him. And he went and hugged his brother. They were so happy. They were celebrating because, you know, like now, now I have a chance to win back my kingdom. While they were all celebrating, nobody noticed that there was a girl walking towards that target area. She is dressed in servant's clothes, so nobody paid her any attention until she got all the way to the middle of the stage. And suddenly people were pointing because there's this random girl that was there. And she picked up the bow and arrow and she looked at the bowl of water, tracking that mechanical fish. And then she let loose the arrow and it flew through the air and it pierced the eye of the mechanical fish right where King Dashan said they need to do the moment of silence. And then everybody started talking. Who is this girl? Who is she? Why is she doing this? What does this mean for the competition? Does it mean that she's going to win this Titania? And of course, Alexi, all color drained from his face, he's like, who are you? And the girl turned to him and she said, I am your twin sister. Dun, dun, dun. That is how this story starts, beginning with this shocking revelation. And it is just one of the many, many surprises that are in store for you. Do not believe anything that happens in the story because you'll find out throughout that there are so many like no way kind of moments in this book. There are so much drama. And even though I have not read the original poem, but all the things that you associate with epic poems can be found in this book. You got gods, you got humans, you got humans who are may not be humans. Gods, of course, are meddling in all the human affairs. They're playing favorites. They're pitting one human against another. And gods themselves have their own dysfunctional family. And because they're immortal, so of course, they have like eons and eons of infighting. Then you have these kingdoms who are engaged in these never-ending war of revenge. You know, everybody is holding grudges and they're trying to avenge the wrongs that have been committed against them. And you got all these kids who are born with all these expectations and obligations to do the right thing for the families and it just keeps going on and on and no one knows how to put an end to all of this and there are also curses there are prophecies of course there's humans who are trying to defy all of them discussion of free will versus this destiny so 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 much drama and all of this happened in space you got kingdoms that are cities that are built upon spaceships you know and of course whenever you have an ai You know, there's always talk about like, well, you know, what does it mean to be a human? And Titania, even though it's a spaceship, I often forget that she is a spaceship because she's definitely a character and not just a mere spaceship. And it's such a fast-paced story. There is never a dull moment in this whole entire trilogy, which I really appreciate because very often when you write a trilogy, there's sometimes there's a middle book syndrome. Sometimes, you know, like the first book is like all spent time on setup. Nope everything. There's just so much stuff happening. And at the heart of all of this is a girl who just wanted to belong. She was unwanted right from the start. And she just won her family back. She just won her family to acknowledge her. It is such an incredible space opera. If you love space opera, you got to check this series out. So it is again, a celestial trilogy by Sangu Mandana. And the first book is A Spark of White Fire. Wonderful, Virginia. It sounds like a wild ride filled with a lot of excitement and a lot of content that's really going to pull you in. So that's excellent. Thank you so much. All right, next we are going to go to Fiona. Fiona, are you reading a similar story? Is it completely different than Virginia's? Let's see what you brought for us today. 
Uh, so I would say this is about as different as it can be. Um, I have chosen a graphic novel that weaves in fairy tales, um, which do include some Western fa- fairy tales as well as a Vietnamese fairy tale. It is called The Magic Fish by Trung Li Nhan. And as you can see, it is one of Lindsay's picks and I think generally is well loved among our staff. For those of you who are watching, you can see the beautiful detail and, of course, the wonderful color palette. (laughs) Okay, where to start with this book? I think I sad cried in this book. I think I happy cried in this book. It was beautiful and touching. It was so beautiful. (laughs) Okay, so this book is about Tien. His parents immigrated from Vietnam. He's now like kind of maybe young high school age. And he has two really good friends. And even though uh, there's not a lot of money in his family because they're sending it back to Vietnam uh, to help out his grandmother, um, there's a lot of love. He has a really lovely relationship with his mother and uh, his father and mother seem to be deeply in love. However, Tien has a secret and although he wants to tell his mother, he can't find the right words because there are is sometimes a language gap between them with his mother having come from Vietnam and Tien growing up in the States. He just can't find the right words in Vietnamese to tell his mother about who he is the way he is. So their main means of deep communication is through reading fairy tales. This is so beautifully handled in the book because they will read a story to each other and the creator has used the characters' imaginations to represent the costumes and the character styles and just um, set out the fairy tale how this person would tell and see it. So the first one is a Cinderella story. We hear that from Tien's point of view. Uh, And the next is actually uh, a Vietnamese Cinderella story called The Magic Fish, which was really neat. You have the daughter of a man whose mother, her mother has passed away, and then her father remarries, and then her father passes away, and she only has her stepmother and stepsister. Uh, and there is a line in this that made me just completely just re-see the like stepmother position. Um, it, it talks about the father dying, and it says the mother's grief turned to anger. And it was the first time I ever felt like I understood the stepmother and her, her, her hate for the, the daughter who, you know, after losing this husband, you know, often we um, see her as a character who marries for wealth or power and then is kind of like happy when the dad's gone. Um, but this just was a really neat moment for me to think of that stepmother differently, um, that she's dealing with this grief and this loss uh, and that she takes that out on our our daughter character, our kind of Cinderella character. So in this tale, the Cinderella character uh, makes friends with a talking fish who her mother used to feed. And so the fish knows all about her mother. And and he says, if you bring shrimp and you feed it to me in the pond, I will tell you all about your mother. And then it just gets more upsetting from there. (laughs) It's just like, oh, I probably shouldn't say this, but the stepmother makes her eat the fish. It's really sad. Um, yeah, but but I, I just loved the way the creator was able to like just fully embrace the bizarreness of uh, fairy tales and like that just intense emotion and just really make them applicable to the person who was telling them. It was so beautiful. And then the final tale is a Little Mermaid tale that is changed in a way that gives Tien an opportunity to embrace and accept his identity. Um, So this is an own voice book about being gay and being a child of immigrants. 
And it sounds like it's very similar to the author's experience with wonderful back pages um, explaining the style and per- inspirations for all of the amazing costumes that he gave each of the fairy tale characters. Uh, I just, I love a book with good back pages where we get to hear from the author. So just, uh, this was beautiful from start to finish. I cried just a lot. (laughs) Um, Even if you're not a graphic novel fan, pick up The Magic Fish by Trang Lin Yen. I cannot wait to see what else he makes. Um, I encountered his work a... Uh, retelling of Beauty and the Beast in an anthology and it was as beautiful and then if you go on his author page he has all of these other drawings of like Thumbelina and uh, Bluebeard and all these other ones and I'm just like I want to see him do every fairy tale Uh, so I hope he continues in that vein. Wonderful thank you so much Fiona beautiful color palette and illustrations all right well I am very curious which book Kareen ended up picking which one really just knocked it out of the park for this topic. So Kareen, which book did you choose for today? Well, Sadie, the book that I choose that I feel like I kind of nailed the assignment is one that thankfully someone returned yesterday. So thank you, random patron of the Port Moody Public Library. I kind of saw it on the cart and I was like, oh, thank goodness. Oh, I'm safe. I'm good. I've got my book because I was struggling. I had about four that I was kind of mulling over that I thought if I can read them all tonight, maybe I'll have something to talk about. But thankfully this book came in. So thank you. Thank you. Random customer of the Port Moody Public Library. I appreciate your timing so much because the book that I chose, which was actually one that I really wanted to read, is the book Love in Color by Bolu Babalola. And it is a retelling of mythic tales from around the world. And specifically, the author talks a lot about West African myths and legends and folklore. I really admire the writer, uh, Bolu, because um, she is a self-styled rom connoisseur, rom-com connoisseur. Um, She loves stories about love and I do too. Um, So she is a rom-com expert and she is the writer behind the Twitter account, Michael B. Jordan's Girlfriend, which I also very much enjoyed. So it was such a pleasant delight to know that she was coming out with a selection of, and I know this is kind of weird for me, short stories. So there are 13 stories in this amazing book. 10 of them are retellings of various different kind of legends and folklore and fairy tales. And three of them are original stories and they all center around love and love in all of its different kind of ways. There is familial love, there is love between people, but what is really important about these stories and what I think this author does really well is that she deliberately set out to take the stories, which sometimes have, let's go with like misogynistic overtones, horrible things happen to ladies, constantly just getting abducted by men, like constantly. And she really takes all that back and makes them very women centered and makes it all about, all about women being seen for who they really are and how they experience love and how, how love is supposed to, is supposed to lift both of you up into being better for each other. Whereas sometimes in these stories, it's all about just getting that prize. So it is an anthology. And what she takes with a lot of these stories is she takes them kind of into modern day. So sometimes they might still be gods and or goddesses, but they are going to high school or they might be, it might be the story of Shahrazadi, but she is an Olivia Pope style political maneuver in the Middle East. She takes all of these stories and just kind of brings an amazing setting to them, an amazing new twist for them. And as she writes about, and what I think that this collection is really, really powerful is because oftentimes in romantic comedies or romantic stories, um, she says that black and brown people are rarely seen. So she really wanted to set out to write a collection and a love letter to romance for black and brown people. Um, She is a Nigerian British author. 
And a lot of these stories kind of draw on different uh, Western African traditions. So there is a story from Nigeria. There is a story from the Calabar people of Nigeria, from the Ashanti tribe of Ghana, um, the Sunike people. Um, there is a story from ancient Greece, one from China, one from the Lesotho, Mesopotamia, like she's drawing from a bunch of different sources, but she is pulling out the beautiful love story behind all of them. I think that what she is really successful at is that she has such a, a, a beautiful take on, on writing a romance story and that she says that it isn't really love at first sight. When you see someone from someone from across the room and you feel like a connection, it isn't love at first sight that you're feeling. It's promise at first sight. It's the promise of something. It's, it's the possibility of it. So yes, if you are a romance fan, and honestly, even if you are a fan of discovering new stories and seeing a new twist on them, I would absolutely encourage you to find out the unique, deeply funny, sarcastic, wonderfully sharp wit of uh, Bolu Babaloa and pick up Love in Color. Excellent, Corrine. I think that is a wonderful pick. I have not read it, but it sounds absolutely wonderful. It really does. I like the idea of uh, the gods and the goddesses just trying to get through high school as best they can, as as we all do. Yeah, trying to not destroy their enemies, but maybe making sure that they hear the sound of rushing water for the rest of their life for cheating on your boyfriend. (laughs) Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that today. Uh, Next up, we have Liz. Liz, what book uh, did you bring for us today uh, for your mythology or retelling? Okay, so yeah, as mentioned earlier, this is could be a bit of a stretch as it's not a retelling per se. Uh, However, it does, I think, does relate to non-Western mythology, most definitely. Now, when I think of Chinese culture, and its history, and its storytelling, I think that I really think of is sort of the the bestiary of it all, like the creatures. There's so many different creatures, whether they be completely um, made up, or maybe they seem like a hybrid of of human and and some sort of animal figure that we're already familiar with. Um, And I feel like these these figures, these creatures, or perhaps these beasts even, um, do really play a strong part in Chinese cultural history and storytelling. So with that, hear me out here. This is Strange Beasts of China by Yang Ge, and it was translated by Jeremy Tiang. So this book was written some time ago uh, by the author and has finally been given a justified translation. So back to these beasts of China. So I'm not an expert in Chinese mythology and beasts, but I think of the dragon, of the phoenix, maybe even those guardian lions you'll see outside of a temple or outside of somebody's home. In terms of a hybrid with a more humanistic figure, maybe you've heard of the monkey king and his mischievous ways and how he has ingratiated himself into human society, causing havoc and trouble for the inhabitants of the town. Well, within Strange Beasts of China, which takes place in a fictional city named Yong'an, we have an unnamed narrator who was at one point a zoology student, and she is now a writer. Now, what she writes about, both in her popular novels, as well as in the newspaper and commissioned articles, is Beasts, or the Strange Beasts of Yong'an. Now, it turns out that there are nine different types of beasts that live in this fictional city. For example, there is the heartsick beast, which any wealthy family can purchase as a pet or a companion for their young child. There is the flourishing beast that can grow into a sapling when planted after death. And there is also the sorrowful beast, who, as the name would suggest, cannot smile because if they do, then they will die. Now, all of these different types of beasts, they all have their own quirks, but on the surface, for the most part, they look very humanoid. They look like anybody else in Yongan City for the most part, although there will be tells, so maybe a furry palm or some gills at the back of their neck that you can't see when they're wearing clothing. 
or maybe a shade of green on a certain part of their body. So for the most part, these beasts live to some degree interwoven within Yang'an society, and some are more accepted than others. However, there is an overall pervasive message of otherness. They are, at the same time, some are an ab- abomination, some are a curiosity, some are, some are there for entertainment, and while others are just simply there to do labor. So this really interesting look at how these beasts are within society and our unnamed narrator becomes more and more ingratiated into learning about these beasts. So with her zoological background and delving into writing these popular articles and novels about these beasts, she drops deeper and deeper into the world of the beasts. And over the course of this book, it kind of starts to get you thinking, with all these beasts in plain sight, maybe they're a bit more deeply ingrained in Yang'an's history and the human's history. Now, I listened to the audiobook version of Strange Beasts of China, which was narrated by Emily Wu Zeller, who is, I think, I feel she's a fantastic audiobook narrator and performer. I thought she was a great choice for this, particularly pronouncing different names and just giving a real flavor and character to our unnamed narrator. So even though we don't know her name uh, and her backstory is revealed gradually throughout, we learn how much she is in deep with the beasts. I just thought she did such a fantastic job. So if you do enjoy a good performance of mythological, semi-mythological, mythological adjacent retelling, then you may wish to check out the audiobook version of Strange Beasts of China by Yang Ge. Thank you, Liz, so much. I, I think that that still counts. I mean, it is influenced by mythology. It is kind of surrounded, as you said, adjacent to mythology. Uh, so I think that it it was a wonderful book to fit into our topic today. Thank you, Sadie. You're welcome. I might be saying that because I feel like mine might also be more adjacent to mythology and influenced by. I looked back on what we set out as our topic, and I'm pretty sure it did say influenced by or retelling. So I am I'm heavily falling onto the influenced uh, by portion of that as well. So for the final book today, for my book, I have chosen one that I had on my to-read list since I learned about it. It came out earlier this year. Uh, it is a debut author. Uh, the author is Namina Forna. She's originally from Sierra Leone and uh, now lives in the States. And this is her very first book. I think it is already being adapted for film or TV. So it um, has kind of already become quite a, uh, a popular hit in the YA world. It's the YA book, uh, not surprisingly. And this book is rooted in and influenced quite significantly by uh, West African mythology. And this is called The Gilded Ones by Namina Forna. And this book follows Dekka. And Dekka is 16 years old. She lives in the village of Irfut. Her father... Not that long ago, Decca's mother uh, passed away from a disease called the red pox. And her and her mother were always seen a little bit as outsiders in the village, whereas the rest of the village is very light-skinned. Decca and her mother have very dark skin. And so just because of that fact, they were always seen as being a little bit other, a little bit not, they, don't, they didn't fit in quite as well. But that didn't stop Decca from creating a life in this village. She has her friends. She has her life with her family. Um, losing her mother was very, very difficult, but she still has this connection to her father. Um, she loves him very much. He loves her very much. And she is very excited at the beginning of this book because she is about to undergo the purity ritual. And this ritual is something that all young women go through when they reach um, the age of 16. And it is a short ceremony where uh, each of these young women is cut to see if their blood runs red. If their blood runs red, then they are pure. Then they are good, upstanding citizens who can prepare for their marriages. However, if their blood does not run red, then unfortunately, they 
are seen as demons. They are no longer welcome and they undergo what's called the death mandate because they are really, there's no reason for them to continue living in the eyes of, um, of this kind of village and this belief system. So Decca is very excited to undergo this, uh, this ritual. Her and her best friend line up with all of the rest of the young women in their village. This is the way that she feels this is going to make her fit in in this village. Once they see that her blood runs red, then everyone will know that she belongs here. However, before she has a chance to undergo this ritual, their village is attacked by what is called a death shriek. And a death shriek are creatures who mercilessly go in and slaughter entire villages and slaughter hundreds of people. Now, up until this point, their village has not been targeted, but right before this ritual, their village is targeted. The soldiers of the village do their best to fight back, to no avail. All of a sudden, one of the death streaks is about to kill Decca's father, and she cries out, no, she cries out, stop. And weirdly enough, it listens. So it stops attacking her father and leaves. All the death streaks leave the village. Now, in this battle, in kind of this whatever has happened, um, Decca unfortunately has been injured. And when she looks down, she realizes that she is bleeding gold. She is not bleeding red, she is bleeding gold. Immediately, even though she has just saved her entire village, every single person turns against her. This includes her best friend. This includes the young man who was just flirting with her five minutes earlier. This includes her father. Every single person turns against her and they kill her. Decca wakes up sometime later. She is somehow alive. All that she remembers is this young man stabbing a sword through her heart. She is chained up in the basement. She doesn't know what's going on. All that she knows is that her blood ran gold and she somehow managed to stop these death shrieks. She is told that she is a demon and that they will continue to kill her until she dies. Her father comes in, looks at her like she is a stranger and then kills her again. This happens nine times where they kill her and she comes back to life and they kill her and she comes back to life. And every single time that they kill her, they take the blood that is spilled and they sell it because the golden blood makes quite a profit. She doesn't even know how long until one day a mysterious woman arrives in the village and gives her an offer. She says, you can stay here in this, the only life that you have ever known, or you can come with me and train to be a part of the emperor's army. And this is an army that is being created entirely of young women, just like you. Because there's actually a name for what you are. You are an Alaki. And an Alaki is a almost immortal descendant of what are called the Gilded Ones. And in most views, the Gilded Ones are seen as demons. The Gilded Ones are seen as these kind of demonic presences that were eliminated years ago, but some of their descendants live and Decca is one of these descendants. Giving up absolutely everything that she has ever known, she decides to follow this woman and go and train to be an Alaki. So she is brought to the capital. She is brought to sort of a military training ground where she has learned how to fight. She is taught how to battle the death shrieks. They're introduced to them one by one and figure out their weaknesses and how to go about killing them. And their ultimate goal is going to be going on raids to kill these nests of death shrieks to protect their country. The more time Decca spends in this compound, she starts to realize that her abilities might be a little bit beyond what some of the other Alaki have. No one else seems to be able to talk to the death shrieks. No one else seems to be able to control the death shrieks. And so she starts to realize that there might be more to her than to everybody else who is there. And there might be more going on than anybody else realizes. So the story kind of continues. She learns how to battle these death shrieks as she learns that 
maybe this is not the direction that she should be taking in life. Maybe these are not uh, the creatures that they seem to be. And she learns kind of what her connection to the Gilded Ones is, what all of these young women's connection to kind of the ancient gods and goddesses and demons of this world is. So it is a very exciting book, um, lots of twists and turns. The ending was not in any way what I expected. So if you are looking for something that is really rooted in that mythology, it is a very strong feminist story. At kind of the base of it, it revolves around the idea that women are constantly being controlled by the men in their life and by the men of this world um, and of many worlds and how they can fight back, how they can become who they are meant to be um, in a world that just constantly tries to push them down. So it is a very, very strong take on that that pushes the strength of women and the strength of community amongst women to the forefront. And yeah, it was a very very wonderful book. Uh, the second one is scheduled. The Merciless Ones is scheduled to come out next spring. So I'm very excited about that. And as I said, I think it has already been adapted to TV or film. So that was The Gilded Ones by Namina Forna. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We have gone all around the world today. We have gone to India. We have gone to Vietnam, West Africa, China. We've gone to many different places in the world. And there are so many other mythologies and other places that you can read about and that you can look into. So if this is something that interests you, I highly recommend going to see what is out there. Just kind of think touched on the surface of this, um, but there's so many other folklores and mythologies uh, that you can read about. So thank you so much to all of my book friends for joining me today. Uh, and thank you to you for listening and for viewing today. And we will see you back here again next week with another episode of Keep It Fictional. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional. Thank you.